There we are. Um, hello, everyone. It's Thursday again. Um, welcome to those people that are uh, are new. For those of you that aren't new, um, welcome back to what must be, what are we on now, like 15, 16 months of this now? Um, so we've probably seen every type of photograph <laughs> that's been sent in, but um, there's still more to go. So we're going to spend the next hour, like we always do, going through Capture One, which is that software. Um, so that logo, if you're not familiar with that software, it's a raw editor. So it's a way of taking raw data out of your camera, processing it, editing it, hopefully improving it along the way and delivering the result that you were expecting or the one that you wanted to get from all of that data you originally captured. So what we're not going to cover today is how to take photos and all that sort of stuff. We're assuming that you're out there with a camera and able to do that. Um, what we are going to cover is taking the images that you guys have sent in um, from all over the place. Um, so as normal, you're you're all over the world, including Alan, who's still awake um, down in, in Australia. Someone else is with you, though. Oh, I can't remember who it was. Um, someone else is down there from Perth, I think, maybe. Anyway, um, so loads of you all over the place sent in your images, and we will try and edit as many of those as we can in this session today. So for those of you that have Capture One, please make sure that you're either on version 20 or 21. 21 is the current or, or latest version. For those of you on 21, you'll actually see the, the version number is 14 um, when you go into the About screen on Capture One. That's fine. 21 is the marketing name. 14 is the version number. Um, so the software version being 14.2 right now, that's the current latest live build. There are obviously beta versions out there, and we, we've talked about it um, over several times before. Um, but from a per or from the purpose of using this software now live with you, we're using the live active production version, um, no further advanced or further behind than that. If you're on version 20, you'll be able to do most stuff um, and follow along as normal uh, in this session. If you're on a previous version, so that would be version 12 um, or 11 or 10 or 9 or whatever, um, you might find some of the things that we show you today you're not um, able to do or aren't accessible or they're not a tool that exists in that version, in which case have a look on CaptureOne.com. Go to your account, you'll see options in there to upgrade if you want to. Of course, you don't have to. Um, but those of you that are on either a subscription version or the latest perpetual license of 21, do make sure you're up to date with 14.2 or 21.2 as it is. If you haven't ever touched Capture One in your life and you want to have a play with it, go to CaptureOne.com, download the free trial, use it for whatever it is, 30 days. Um, there's no limit. Um, see if you like it, see if you can break it, um, and, then, uh, and then make your decision from there. So let's go into Capture One. And before we actually go into one of the images, I thought I'd take um, just a couple seconds today talking through um, variants and new variants, cloning variants and whatever, because we've seen a couple of questions recently about what happens with variants um, and what does that mean to the actual raw file. So in this session as well, just a reminder, please keep it interactive. So if you if I say something that doesn't make sense or you disagree with, by all means, um, put it in the comments as we're going along. We'll try and answer questions as we go. There may be a slight delay. That's the way that um, streaming works. So if I don't see your comment for a couple of seconds, don't worry. It's not, it's not me ignoring you. Um, it's just the way that unfortunately there's a delay um, from me to you and your comment back. But we'll get through as many of them as we can. So versions, variants, and cloning and stuff, um, it gets a little complex when I say very simple things like send us your files with your adjustments. So here's our Capture One interface. We can see our file structure on the left, um, browser on the right, and this is normally the viewer. This is normally where our image appears, and I'm just using an old um, image that we actually did some, um, some live stuff with a while ago here for an example. To hide this viewer, press the G on your keyboard or you go to the view menu and just click on viewer and turn that off and you'll get a big browser. If this looks really, really small like that and you're missing data labels, first thing to check for the labels underneath this is on your uh, customized browser, make sure you've got labels enabled. But it can be that even with it enabled, you don't see them. And the reason is because the preview thumbnails are too small. So we're going to increase this. There are our labels appear. So we now have our star ratings, our color ratings, and the file name. And then as I get bigger and bigger and bigger, we get more and more space to play with the browser. So the first thing is if we're just dealing with the browser, of course, you've got the option to make these things bigger or smaller as you wish. Now, variants. 
So quite often when we're editing, and we're going to do this today, what you'll see me do is clone a variant. And the reason is, let's take this picture. So in a layout term, this is one picture. We can see that because it's got one file name here and it's just on its own. We can also see we're not hiding anything and we'll come back to that in a second because there's no filter on here. If there was a filter, this would be orange up here. We'll do that in a second. So this is one picture. All of these three are another one picture. Capture One is a non-destructive editor, so it's not creating copies of those pictures. It's creating containers which contain the picture itself, so the raw data, the raw file, and a layer or a load of adjustments which are registered to the, that picture. And those adjustments are what we play with in here. So things like the HDR or high dynamic range area. Let's say we had added some clarity in, maybe we'd brightened it a little bit, and we can see the preview updating. But this isn't the raw data. This is a container which has the underlying raw file and a load of adjustments. Which means if I export all of these as an EIP, so a package, if I go to export originals and choose this one, Packers EIP, and this is how you send in your images with adjustments, that Packers EIP sends me or sends you or, or whoever you're sending it to one big container called whatever the file name is .eip and in that container is one copy of the raw file one copy of the raw data the actual raw file itself and then these shells and the shells or variants are the versions that give me that one raw file but with three different options so if i create a clone of this variant that's going to take all the adjustments that i've made create another version of it another container with another load of adjustments in, but I haven't actually altered the raw file. At no point do I actually touch the raw file. It's never touched in Capture One. It's always there as it was on the day that you shot it. If I create a new variant, so cloning a variant takes all of the adjustments I already made and creates another container for that variant with those adjustments. So let's create a new variant. Now a new variant, and you can see this bar building up here. So this image here where we only had one variant or one version of it, there's no bar because it's this file name. That file is for that file there. That's it. This file name, this EIP, contains, and this would be the same if it was a raw file, a .cr2, a .nef, it didn't, doesn't matter. This bar tells me that this file or this raw is associated with each of these containers. So now it has five containers. When I create a new variant as opposed to a clone, so if I clone the variant we saw, it creates a copy of that raw file, this one here, with these adjustments. So I now have two of exactly the same. If I create a new variant, it goes back to the original raw file, look on this side here on the, the adjustments, and it resets everything back to the original raw. So I've obviously got before and after on my on my images, and so we can let's just go into our viewer. So I've got my original raw on the left and the one with the adjustments on the right. But if I actually wanted to compare side by side the literal raw file, this one to one with adjustments, so now I hold down the command key or con um, control key in Windows, I've now got on the left the one with let me just turn off before and after with my adjustments, the right, the original raw. If I'm missing some of these, so let's say this one has a red color tag. So I go to my browser and I'm missing some of my variants and I can't find them. Very easy. So let's say I've um, filtered only things that are green. Well, all of a sudden, I'm missing a load of images. And I mentioned earlier, if you get to your browser and you think, hmm, I'm missing some shots, the first thing to do is look in this search bar. So if you're in the big browser, it's going to be up here. If you've got the viewer on, it's going to be up here. And in my search bar, it will show me, because it's orange, either this number, which shows me the number of images I'm seeing, or under the magnifier, I see this little, uh, the three dots go orange. That tells me there's a filter applied. So if I want to see everything, I've got to clear that filter. So I can just come out of here, go to my magnifier, press the X button on there. And now I see the number of images I'm showing, six, is not orange, it's gray. So that's telling me I'm not filtering anything out, and there are all my images. So hopefully that sort of clears up the, the idea of clones, new variants, so clones of variants, 
takes everything you've already got in the variant you've selected and creates an exact duplicate of it. It is not copying the raw file. There is only ever one version of that raw file underlying all of these variants. A new variant takes the raw file and it creates another empty container ready for you to adjust. But again, it's not creating another copy of the original raw file. It's just creating another container referencing that raw data, but where it's a new variant, it has no adjustments already made. Hopefully, that's all cool. And we all we all get that. If you don't, um, by all means, put stuff into the comments and we'll, we'll try and cover it. But, you know, it's it, it's... It is frustrating and it is complicated sometimes when you end up with lots of variants. So, for example, and I'll show you in a second, some of you have sent in images and I don't know which variant is actually your latest one, for example. Um, so Jim's just mentioned, you know, it'd be nice to be able to label variants so I could have a variant for print, etc. Well, of course, you can go into the metadata for a variant. So we can go into our information um, and we can put in keywords saying this is the final one. So, you know, this one is final. Whereas if I go to this variant, that keyword's not in there. So I can do it that way. Uh, there are ways of doing it, but I tend to have a numbering system, which is, you know, one stars are, they're acceptable. Two stars, we're now starting to, to whittle it down. Three stars are the ones that I'm going to edit. Four stars are the ones that I've edited. And five stars are the variants that I'm now ready to print and I'm happy with and they are locked in. Some people do it with color coding. There's lots of different ways of doing it, but yes, you, you can separate out the variants and you can do it through either keywords or through um, EXIF data, or you can do it through colors and numbers. But it's this clone versus new bit that hopefully now um, really makes sense because um, I know it's confusing some people as well, especially when they go to export an original because they, I think a lot of people think that the original means that you're not containing any um, data. If you export the variant, you're basically taking that container in the raw and you're smashing them together and you're creating effectively a final image as an output. If you export originals and you have this pack as EIP or include adjustments um, enabled, that takes the whole container as a Capture One file so that we can open it again in Capture One and see those adjustments. Right, let's go on then to an actual picture uh, where we left off last week, so Leo's shot. Um, and we've, we can see in here lots of variants. Um, so we've got you know, the uh, what's more close to the original here, uh, one without the boats. The boats all went missing, and by the look of it, some clarity in the water has been removed. Um, one here, which is a very similar shot. Um, here, I think we've got rid of maybe some dust spots or something, but this is effectively the one that we're going to work on. And the issue here was the reverse GND filter, so the, the reverse graduated filter. So for those of you that don't know what that is, um, very quickly. This is a standard, I'm using a piece of paper so you can see it, a standard um, graduated filter. So a, a soft GND, darker at the top, lighter at the bottom, and a, a gradient in between, hence graduated filter. Let's get rid of that one. If you hear glass smashing, it's because I dropped it. Um, if you have a horizon line or something straight, what a lot of people elect to use is a hard GND, so a harder filter. So it's still dark at the top, light at the bottom, but this gradient in the middle, this this bit that it uh, that it transitions, is a lot tighter, so we get a nice harsh line across the middle. The problem with those filters, though, is they get darkest at the top of the image. Well, if, it's, if you're shooting sunset on the horizon, the temptation then, instead, is to use a more specialist filter like this one. Ready? Surprise a reverse GND, which basically has light at the bottom, so in fact no um, graduated um, neutral density element at the bottom, darkest in the middle with a little gradient, and then it gets lighter as it gets up to the top. And that actually makes sense at a sunset if you think about it, because the sky doesn't get brighter as it gets away from the sun, it gets darker. So you've got a dark foreground, a very bright horizon, and then it slowly gets lighter as it gets up towards the top. So the temptation is to use a reverse GND. The challenge with the reverse GND is you end up with this dark strip just along the horizon. And if you don't quite get the GND's um, transitional point at the right spot, you can end up with what we've got here um, in Leo's shot, which is the horizon out here getting darker. Then this bit here, actually, it's done correctly because this is the lightest part of the image. But we're still in this darkest part of the filter here. 
and then it slowly gets lighter as it gets further away. So effectively, that GND, that reverse GND, was too strong for this difference in light. This probably needed maybe a, a one or two stop reverse GND, almost to the point of, of not being worth it, rather than what was probably a three stop GND looking at this, or maybe a, a four. So what we've got is this unevenness here. That's all. That's the only problem with this shot, really. Um, if I look at the before and after, you know, Leo's chosen to get, well, as we talked about, get rid of some of these boats, um, de-clarified um, the, the foreground, so softened some of the detail here. So we don't see these uh, relatively harsh waves. Let's just go in there. So we go from there to there. Some healing brush stuff and whatever. Um, and it's just this bit, this sort of line that we want to deal with. So really simple uh, way of doing this. We're going to create a new layer. I'm going to call it Horizon. And we're going to choose our graduated filter, funnily enough, but the digital type, not the, uh, not the physical type. And I'm just going to draw... Um, a line effectively, so remember where we start the filter is going to be 100% and then when we stop is going to be zero. So I'm actually going to draw a hard lined filter that goes all the way across that horizon. I don't care if I'm going to hit the sun, it's not going to matter here. Um, so we've got now a filter that covers that sky, or a uh, graduated uh, mask that covers the sky. Now it's slightly off uh, its normal axis, so I could have used the shift key to do that uh, more straight. But what I can also do is zoom in a little bit now, now that it's made, and get that angle correct. So I can make sure we're actually over the edge of the horizon. So there, and we're gonna move it down, maybe there. So what I'm looking for is, is this even across the width of it, yes. Now, you'll notice the middle of it isn't on the horizon. There's a reason, because if I put the middle of this on the horizon, exactly on the horizon, I start darkening, remember this is the 50% point, I start darkening parts of the sea. Now I can get rid of that risk by holding down the Option key or the Alt key on Windows and making this filter's transition asymmetrical. So if I hold down the Option key, rather than doing this, which keeps that 50% in the middle, hold down the Option key or the Alt key and do the same, and it only changes this bottom side, keeps it separate from the rest. So I can now move this down to get a tighter transition across the whole of that horizon. We can see the angle is still slightly off, so I'm just going to fix that a little bit. Leo's online and just confirmed. There we go, three stops. Honestly, Leo, that's that would have been the only thing that um, you, you could have done differently in this case. Is, is just, oops, sorry, had a, um, had a slightly lower um, level of density on the filter. But yeah, frankly, it's fixable, so don't, don't worry about it too much. Right, I'm not worried about over here because this sun is going to blow everything out. I am worried about over here. So with my horizon filter, I'm going to do a couple of things. Number one, take down my clarity. So that's just going to help reduce contrast in this stuff and get rid of uh, some of these potential boundaries in here. The next one, it's going to sound weird, the skin tone tool. I'm going to choose two points. So I'm going to go here in this pinky area and I'm going to say everything I want to have uniform lightness and then we're actually going to go, hmm, no, maybe we do it at one point. I'm just going to move this baseline area here and say we're going to go all the way from the pinks up to the yellows and the blues and keep this uniformity really, really even. I can then go onto my shadow, and this is going to sound odd, but lifting up shadows will also help to get rid of some of this line. Even though that line doesn't seem like a shadow, you see the difference. So when I'm moving the shadows here, all of the sky is surely in the highlights, right? It's, it's the sky. Um, only it's not. As I move my mouse around, we can see some of it starts to head towards the darker parts of the histogram. Not fully in it, but it's towards there. And the tail of my shadow area here, so although the shadow is going to affect mostly down here, it doesn't just stop, it tails off. So the very bottom end of that shadow adjustment will actually start to affect this area in the sky here. So lifting up shadows, using the skin tone tool, declarifying it, we get to a, a slightly better place in that term. So let's turn it off here and turn it on. Now look at what it's done to the sun. I don't like that too much. So what we're going to do is we're going to go onto our eraser. I'm going to see my mask, press M on the keyboard to see my mask. With my eraser, really soft brush, 
really low opacity because I'm going to go over it a few times. And I'm going to start erasing on the mask. When I do that, it's going to say, do you want to rasterize it? The reason is because once I do this, I can no longer edit this as a gradient. It's now as if I'd painted it on. In this case, I'm fine with that. So yes, rasterize. And now I can paint or erase with brush strokes certain parts of this that will help get that sunshine back to the glow that we had before. So we've got rid of most of the dark line here. We're back to at least the same sort of tones, but we've now got the reverse problem where we've got a lighter area up here um, and still not down here. So we're going to add another one, another layer, and call it Top Sky. And with the Top Sky, or are we, sorry, Paula, uh, no lumen range with the sun. No. The reason being, the sun here is absolutely at 255, but as I get further away, you see we start getting into sort of 217, 210, 209 which is starting to be no difference actually to some of these areas around here and some of the brighter areas on the horizon. So I'm not going to get that nice fall off. It's just easier, frankly, to just erase out that and have a nice smooth fall off away from the sun than rely on um, just the Luma range to do that. Um, you could exclude it. Of course, that's your choice. Um, I just I think you, you're probably easier just erasing out the, the hole that you don't want um, in the shot. Uh, so, let's go to our top sky layer, um, and I'm just going to add another gradient layer from up here down to here. So it's going to stop before the horizon, and with that layer, we're going to pull down the exposure a bit. So almost adding in one of those, um, one of the traditional GND filters, and I'm going to increase our saturation a little bit too. So let's go actually quite a way up here. And then I'm also going to reduce our clarity down and, you guessed it, skin tone tool. I'm going to go to maybe this point here, so this sort of pinky area, get it to cover some of the blue as well. And we're just going to uniform up the lightness and the saturation. So it's not quite perfect. It's never going to be exactly spot on, exactly what you wanted um, at the point that you were doing the, the filter shot. But... If we go from there, which has this very dark line on here, in fact, let's just use what we've done with um, variants. So let's right click on here, clone the variants. So that's going to take all the adjustments I made, including the fact that I had these layers turned off. So on this variant, I'm going to turn the layers on. On the original variant here, we're going to have the layers turned off. And let's just zoom in to the area along here, maybe. And we can see we've just softened. This hard line here has just been softened. And it's softened effectively. In fact, it's a bit of a shame. I'm just seeing on a preview here on, on the compressed version. You don't quite see the, the smoothness in this. Um, but the smoothness you can also increase, of course. So we can go back to our horizon. Um, and we can increase the smoothness and saturation, for example. Um, we can also include, you know, increase the smoothness in terms of the color, so the, the, the hue on the uh, on the sunset itself but effectively we're just reducing the impact of that really hard line along here and we're just softening it here and then darkening the top part so that we don't see quite the same um, well noticeable um, difference there so there's our after which yeah it's not quite the same on the uh, on the preview screen which is a bit of a shame um, and there's our before with a harder line. Uh, one question from Pascal, would it help to reduce contrast? Not necessarily. Um, unfortunately, most of this data up here is sort of in the same bulky area um, of the histogram. So the contrast tool may not help us attack it. We can try it. So let's just reduce contrast down here. And the same with the horizon there. It, all we're getting now is a, an extra layer almost along here or an extra um, line which which doesn't help us. Um, so I'd, I'd just steer clear of that. We could play with levels a little bit, but these are all little tweaks that you're going to do just to sort of get the best out of it. So that's what I'd do in terms of fixing a reverse GND. But if you had the choice, number one, um, maybe a hard GND would have been better in, in this scenario because you wouldn't have had that falling off of, of brightness as it went up from the horizon. Um, and number two, the the other argument being um, potentially using only a two-stop um, reverse GND would have avoided the um, 
the, the quite harsh um, fall off that you've got on there. But that's it. Um, it it's perfectly rescuable. It's perfectly possible to to get back to those colours um, from where you were. And if we look at you know there are before to after, we've, we've certainly got it um, back. Um, in fact, we've reduced even the ring around the sun here. Um, but just be careful with those filters. You know the these these things they're they're great stuff um if it's the right situation for that filter the temptation on the horizon is always to use one typically you're using one because the sky above is a lot darker than the area on the horizon if it's not in, in this case that filter is going to give you a very weird effect um as we can see and that's how you end up with uh, with this stuff going on so that's Leo's. Uh, let's head across to Fabrizio's uh, damselfly. Um, so uh, it, in general, there's not much we're going to change with this one, to be honest. Um, there's our original. There's our final. I like the toning on it, like the, the coloring on it. It looks good. Um, there's only one thing that I picked up on, in fairness, on this, on this shot. Um, and that is this area here of blown highlights. If I turn our exposure warning on, so my exposure warning is set pretty high um, so that you've all got an idea. If I go to my preferences and we look at under exposure, my warning is set at 255. So the default for Capture One is to have it a lot lower between, I think it's 250 as default, maybe it's 248 or something. To me, I want to know when something is literally clipped. So I want to know when it's at 255. Um, and to me, if something is literally above 255, um, we've got no data in it, effectively. But we kind of do. And that's the thing that I want to cover off with this shot. So again, so we don't damage the original, I'm going to clone this variant, which means we've got all of Fabrizio's edits, um, but I'm not affecting his original um, version. And what I'm going to do is a couple of things. So number one, let's just pull down the exposure and see... Oh, sorry, not on our vignette layer. Let's go back to our background layer pull down the exposure and see if there is detail in those highlighted areas. So there's not here, really, um, even though our exposure warning is now getting better. It's just reducing the, the luminosity. It's just going from 255 down to 170, but there's not really any more data there that it's pulling back. But on this area here, well, we've got quite a lot of information. That So in there, it's blown, where it was at zero, pretty much. Here we've got actually all this color, all this stuff here that we can pull out. So the data is there, or well, there's certainly more data there than what our current exposure allows us for, but it's just clipping. So if it's clipping, and we've already got some highlight and white recovery in here, we've got a couple of choices. One version of, of edits that we could do is changing our base characteristics. So the, the curve from auto, which is effectively film standard, and what that means is when that raw file is brought into Capture One, the interpretation Capture One is going to do is to put a little bit of an S-curve in, so a bit of a boosting contrast, make the shadows a bit darker, make the highlights a bit lighter, effectively make the shot pop. If we want to get closer to that raw data, we choose Linear Response. And Linear Response, you'll see it becomes almost dull, um, quite flat. And the reason is because that histogram is no longer stretched as much, no longer pushed. And it's a lot flatter and calmer and closer to the raw data. So immediately we get a little bit better. So here's our film standard. There's our linear response. We get a little bit more information than we would have done um, in film standard. But with Fabrizio making all these changes on the auto curve or film standard curve, changing it now to linear response is going to be a bit of an issue because we're going to have to redo all of those changes to, to accommodate for that change in our base characteristic. So instead, knowing that the data is there, what we can do is some very targeted work on those highlights. So we've already got this mask in here on the fly itself. But if I look at this mask in detail, so I'm going to click on the mask button here and say, show me the grayscale mask, or you can do um, option and M. Instead of seeing the, the red version of that mask, we see the grayscale version. And I think, looking at this, it's probably a Luma range that's been used and then rasterized um, somewhere. But again, like talking like we were before, that Luma range means that not all of this is masked. So in order for it to be masked 100%, I should be seeing white areas. So I should be seeing here 
this area here being completely white. And this is the area here that's actually blown out. So let me just turn off my mask. This is the area here that's blown out. But in my grayscale mask, it's not white. It's not fully masked. So even though I've got on the damselfly here um, layer, the fly masked, any adjustment I make isn't going to be to 100%. So I need kind of another layer. And I'm going to be really, really rough with the layer because it doesn't need me to be anything other. So let's create a new, uh, call it uh, empty adjustment layer, and we're going to call it um, fly highlights. Choose my brush. 100% um, opacity, 100% flow, bit smaller, very soft. And I'm just going to, with my mask turned on, just paint over where I believe, in fact, we can turn our exposure warning on, where I believe those overexposed areas are into there. I'm going to leave the overexposure on the leaves because I think it actually works, but it's just on the fly that I'm worried about. If I want to play with a Luma range now, I can, because I'm going to use a different range. And I think my feeling is that when Fabrizio created the Luma range, the, the fall off, and that's what you're seeing on here, the fall off here actually excluded the brightest parts of the fly. So I'm going to shift this Luma range all the way up to include every bright part of the fly and then we're going to come up to here nice fall off nice soft fall off there and we're going to add in a bit of radius and that's going to soften effectively the edges of of that range of, of brightnesses um and we're going to apply that now i'm going to switch to see that in grayscale so i can see what's going on so remember grayscale mask is option and m instead of just m and now you see the difference in these two masks. So the original damselfly mask has got the areas of the fly that were blown out, not fully masked. They're in this sort of gray area. Here, we've got the highlights fully masked. They're completely white in this mask. And the reason being, my Luma range is very, very specific. Only target the brightest parts, but all of the brightest parts, and then taper off as you get to the midtones. So that's done. Let's just turn off our mask. And I'm going to turn off for the exposure warning. And with the fly highlights alone, I'm going to pull down those highlights, pull down the whites, and you see we start to get some of that detail back. So it's never going to be all the way back at all, but without and with. And we can see we're getting more of this color in. Along here, we're getting slightly more detail in some of these highlighted areas here. As I said, we could, of course, um, pull back that exposure, just like before as well. Uh, just be careful you're not darkening the image too much. But you're never going to get all of those details back. But if I look at this shot here without this mask, and with, you can see all this extra stuff that the camera actually captured. It was just in the highlights. It was blown out. So we go from there to there. We get all this color back in the legs. We get this color back on its body. And I'd say that's probably a slightly better place to be um, with the highlights recovered than having it quite so hot um, when you zoom in. And that's it, to be honest, Fabrizio. Um, I think there were, yeah, there was a couple bits down here that potentially on a healing layer, I'd be tempted just to lose that one and lose that one. It's just a little, little cleanup. But other than that, it was a nice shot. That works. Um, it's a nice crop. It's, nice, it's nicely set up. Um, it's just if I go from there with these highlights on, to there, I get so much more out of what you've captured um, in terms of the detail and the color on that on that fly. If we don't like this leaf being included in that layer, remember on our fly highlights layer, yes, you have a Luma range, but it's also effectively just a brushed layer. So I can equally still go in with a soft eraser and just erase the leaf out of it if I didn't want the leaf to be recovered quite so much as well. But that's it. Um, so where are we, Jim? That grey luma mask could make an interesting image on its own. We can, I, we can try it. Kind of cool, um, bit X-ray like. Uh, but yeah, I mean, play with the luma masks. Um, I'm not sure how we'd print out the luma. I don't think you can print the luma mask. Hmm, you have to screen print it. Maybe do a mosaic, loads and loads of different screen prints. But yeah, um, kind of cool on its own. Uh, Leo's just asked on the previous. It was your previous shot, Leo. Um. 
is the blue shade on the left above the sea caused by the alignment with the mask with the horizon if i if you're talking about what i think you're talking about yes it is um so this bit here um the blue shade and the above yeah so this is where effectively that that transition point of the filter remember on um an electronic filter so when we go to our horizon filter Remember, I've deleted this, uh, I've rasterized it, unfortunately, but let me just add a new one on so you can see. On a electronic version of the filter, yes, this is a standard transition, and I can change that transition, but it's 50% in the middle, 100% up here, 0% down here. I can hold down the option key, and I can offset that, so I can have a harder line from 50 to 0 than I do from 100 to 50. Or I could go the other way. So I could have a soft line, 50 to 0, but a hard line, 100 to 50. On your filter, you can't do that. You're fixed. It's this. So this line here, you know, you've got some transition for sure, but that transition is fixed. So there's unless you had a really hard line, a proper, proper hard line, there's no way you're going to be able to get it across that horizon and just stop immediately on the sea. There's always going to be some overlap. Or you're going to end up pulling it off the sea, in which case you're always going to have a bright spot um, just above it. It's why um, reverse GND filters are really handy, um, but also really painful <laughs> sometimes to use, um, simply because it, they're just so fiddly. Um, sometimes to get right in terms of their positioning that's all it's the positioning that's the most important part right let's head across to joe's picture of a tree um which sounds doesn't sound quite as exciting um but it actually is a very very cool scene so here's our raw um and joe's transitioned it across to be black and white so here's one version of it and here's the other um that transition has been made with the good old um where are we there was a on the back uh, da, da, da. was it just that or was it just desaturated or is it a style maybe i'm getting confused here there's our original which is an rgb shot and there's our eip with black and white enabled so why is this eip not showing up as enabled that's very strange isn't it very odd um normally i'd expect to see this one <laughs> this one ticked but for some reason it's not in this one it is um so you've got two variants in here um this one here and that one i would you know i'm, I'm actually quite comfortable um with with this one so yeah joe's just said the saturation is negative i i get that but, um, yeah, I'd, I'd still expect to have seen, or maybe it is, it's just hiding. I, I got the impression that this would only appear when we do a black and white conversion. But no, when we put the saturation down to completely 100, um, we get the same equivalent histogram, obviously, as, as what you do when you, when you do a black and white conversion. Just never done it that way. A bit odd. Um, but it works, so cool. So what's rather funny with this is the actual black and white conversion, so the one that Capture One has done, and this is where we can use um, these sliders down here to choose how sensitive we are. For instance, here's our original. There's a bit of blue here. There's a bit of orange and so on down here. Let me just clone this one. So if we say we want to make the yellows a bit brighter, that's going to affect down here. If we want to take the blues down, that's going to affect the sky, obviously, more. And it's using these colors, so these um, these parts of the spectrum, against the underlying raw data to say, right, if you were a blue area, like the sky, then make yourself darker. If you're a reddy, yellowy area down here, like the grass, make yourself lighter and green somewhere in the middle. But there wasn't much green in the original. So we can tweak these paddles down here effectively to make the black and white conversion that Capture One does by enabling this tick box, to, it'll make it react to different colors differently. But actually, the version that you've done here with that saturation, in my opinion, works better um, than the actual um, normal black and white conversion thing in here. And effectively, it's no different to just having all of these reset. Uh, in fact, let's just reset there and just enable black and white. 
um, and add some contrast in. So if we go onto here with our background, we put even more contrast in, but I'm going to explain what's going on here in a second. And then pull down our, well, no, maybe not brightness, maybe we do it with exposure. Um, we're going to get to roughly the same place. Now, here's the thing. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, with the contrast tool. So to some people, when I moved that contrast up, you'd have been surprised that the tree got brighter. Think about what the contrast tool is doing. So the contrast tool takes the midpoint of our histogram, so the 50% brightness or 1 to 8 level in the histogram, and it, think, it thinks, right, okay, anything that's darker than this, make it darker still. So put a bit of an S curve in, so darken that. And anything brighter than this, make it brighter still. So ramp up the bits that are brighter than the midtones. So where's the tree? The tree isn't darker um, than the midpoint in the histogram. And this is the problem with the difference between our eyes and our brains. And what Capture One is looking at, which is raw data. So to us, of course the tree is darker than the sky. So if I add contrast, I'd expect the tree to get darker and the sky to get lighter. What Capture One sees is you are sat in the upper mid-tones, you are sat in the highlights, so as I add contrast, you're both going to get brighter. And likewise, if I reduce contrast, it's going to affect the sky as much as it does the tree. Not quite as much because there's a bit of ramping in there, but that contrast function only really works in terms of separating objects if you've got things that are on either side of that midpoint in the histogram. If it's all bunched up, like this one on the one side of it, it's not going to help you. Had it been, and that's why I played with exposure afterwards, had we seen the histogram here, so I've just shifted that exposure, so we've got a midpoint now where we've pretty much got the data smack bang in the middle. Now if I add contrast, we'll see the highlights getting lighter and the tree getting darker because it's effectively squeezing that histogram slightly wider. And you'll see it's not quite the same as a, a perfect cut, but you'll see it's picking up on the tree separately to that of the sky because the data sits in the middle. Where the data sits to the right, any contrast change is going to shift it all across. So instead of that contrast change, what we can do is use either curves or levels. So Joe's already put in some level changes in here. If I were to temporarily reset this, you'll see it's a lot more faded. And that's because every bit of data, just like before, is sat in the same sort of tonal range here in that histogram. By doing the change that Joe's done, which is effectively saying, right, this point here is no longer going to be just a bit bright. It's going to be white. And this point here is no longer going to be, in fact, here is no longer going to be a little bit dark. It's going to be our shadow tone, our, our black. So it's going to take from 50, what was a value of 50, and make that zero. If you want this to be really contrasty, I'd pull this further. I would make the brights brighter, and I would make those darks darker here. And you've still got room, remember, to shift along the midpoint. Now, you've got an issue out here as a result of doing that. Obviously, it gets darker as it goes to the side. It's not a problem. We're going to add a new layer, put a graduated filter on that layer. And we could do this, actually, with levels just on that layer. But we don't need to. We can do it with exposure. So I'm just going to increase our exposure on the right-hand side. That's not going to affect the tree at all because on this mask, by the time it gets to the tree, this is our 0% point, 50% point, 100% point there. If I want this to be even softer, we can. And effectively, we're just brightening up that right-hand side, not too much, so that we don't get that dark fall off on, on the other end. Likewise, we can do the same on the left-hand side. So I'm going to create another one. So let's go right and brighten. And this one, left and brighten. Same thing. Um, so another graduated filter. Oops, let's get rid of our before and after. It's going to get in the way. Uh, very, very soft pull again. Want it to finish before the tree. And we're just going to increase our exposure a touch, not too much. And we get to there. Now, that's a little bit different to here. So in this version here that you had, which was the, I think, the negative, satura yeah, the negative saturation version, um, We've got a bit of flattening. It's, it's sort of quite grayish on this right-hand side and on the left. We've almost got a, a vignette that's happened here. 
on this one here which is the actual black and white conversion i think it's a bit too sparse so this one is sort of a, a, a mix so it's taking the black and white conversion effectively um, but then just adding in some extra contrast boost through the levels and just squeezing them even more than you did in the first place and then adding on the right hand and left hand mask just to even out that scene so the brightness stays stable across it apart from where the tree is now it also means if i go back to my background of course i can just darken down that tree a bit more because we're protecting the right and the left side with that extra gradient um, we could even play with the mid-tone if we wanted to but to me that's probably a, a more um i guess balanced um, version of it we haven't had to sacrifice losing anything going too bright or too dark in order to get that tree to really stand out i'm just gonna tweak the right and left hand side a little bit more so again they're nice and even so that works um, but it's a little bit washed out this one a lot washed out but at least it's even across the board this one we've got that evenness back um and we haven't lost any detail on the tree in fact the tree just becomes a little bit more um a little bit more stark a bit more barren a bit more a bit more obvious let's, let's put it that way um so yeah and, and to michael's point um yeah contrast working either side of the midpoint just remember especially if i go back to this raw look at where all that data is i see a darker tree than the sky the contrast tool does not it sees it all sat to the right hand side of that midpoint and the more contrast you dial in the brighter and brighter it's going to make it all because it doesn't have anything on the left the only scenario where that would work is if all of the data was in the middle and I start pushing contrast there. But then, oh, there's a pylon in the background. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> it's tempting to just play with maybe not quite so much black and white, but uh, I don't know. I like this one. That, that works. Okay, so that's... Um, what was that? That was Joe's. Um, so given... We've got two Michaels images, I think, today. We'll definitely get to one of them. We may not get to both, but we'll try. Um, so Michael L. Um, you can probably guess what I'm going to say, although I'm, I'm hoping I'm right <laughs> in what I'm about to say. Um, this is Michael's shot, and, and the, the note that came in was Michael had previously edited uh, an image and had then revisited it and, and done it differently in, in more recent times than the original edit. I'm hoping this is the original edit, and I'm hoping this is the new one. Um, if this is the original edit and this is the new one, uh, we need to have a different conversation. <laughs> But um, if, if, if this was the original one, I'm pleased we got to hear. So this is the original edit, and this is what we would call something that's slightly cartoony, um, to be nice. Um, I don't like this style of editing, I, I've got to be honest. So if it is the, the one that, that's the final edit, um, apologies in advance, Michael, but it's not my, it's not my style of, um, of, of output. Um, the reason being... It's so, so HDR'd that we're just seeing artifacts of HDR rather than the content in the shot. So if I go to our original, yes, we had some shadows in here and we were losing detail. But the temptation, and I know, I know it, the temptation is to try and recover all that detail. And when we recover it, we instantly go to clarity and our HDR tool. And if we look at the layers of HDR in this shot on the background... We've recovered highlights halfway. We've recovered whites almost all the way. We've lifted shadows a bit and lifted black, well, two-thirds of the way up to the, the maximum. Then we've got a mask on our hill, um, and it's a relatively rough mask, which explains why we're getting some halo stuff, but I'll show you that in a second. And that hill then further reduces the highlights, leaves the shadows where they are, but further reduces the whites even more as well. So we get, you know, uh, almost whatever 150 200 percent um recovery on the whites then we've got another layer which is the darkness layer which is this hill again um and we've got uh you know there's a couple of bits missing but that darkness layer then takes the shadows lifted by 100 percent again and the blacks lifted by 50 or 88 percent again it's just too much recovery and and the recovery is done with masks which means that 
what and we can show you in here on that mask let's just turn the mask off we can see the shadow has been recovered here but not here why because the mask stops um in fact we've got a weird extra bit of mask in there if i put in the rest of the mask in here we'd see that we're lifting the rest of the shadow in this building but then in some of the places that mask goes off of the building so if it goes up here into the cloud then we end up with you know an extra halo and that's what we're seeing these extra bits all around here so hdr um it's a bit like wine a little bit's good too much you're in a messy state um same thing here please be careful with those hdr sliders if you're going to use the hdr sliders you have to get your masks spot on they have to be accurate they have to be exactly in the area you want to affect and not in the areas that you don't also if you're going to use hdr limit it to one round of hdr unless you're trying to recover something so if i go back to our damselfly here this area on the body that we've just edited if i look at the highlights here we've pulled down the highlights and the whites in this area on the mask and also on the background the highlights and the whites have come down as well so that's where i'm trying to really heavily aggressively fix something get back some detail and data from the raw file itself so it's a very acute fix to a very small area and that's where i'm trying to recover a very hot pixel specifically not the whole image if i'd done that to the whole image let's create a new filled layer and i pull up our shadows up our blacks down our whites down our highlights okay and then we say actually we're going to go again we're going to also pull down our highlights and our whites again and the blacks and the shadows up as well we end up in a, a really weird place compared to our actual shot and and imagine now if i'd drawn a mask around it it would look literally like a cartoon and that's where we get to here if the masks aren't accurate and we've overplayed the hdr so moving on i am very hopeful <laughs> that this is the actual final image um from michael and, and i'm hoping this is the the new version because what we've got in here is actually some nice adjustments in here so the background yes the shadows have been lifted let's go back to our original press the before and after button up here or the y key on your keyboard and whoops let me just uh come back out a bit too <laughs> a bit too close so we needed to lift up the shadows of course but that doesn't need a mask to do it because we know that it's just the shadows overall we want to lift up and by not masking it we don't end up with some of these excess um, halos around the edge of the image so lifting up the shadows good call lifting up the blacks so the very darkest part of the shadows good call pulling down the whites so the very very brightest parts of the highlights and the highlights all the way down again i don't have an issue with with any of those quite extreme numbers um because it's been done without um, drawing in specific areas that, that can go wrong personally i'd be tempted to back off a little bit of highlight a little bit of white and i'd actually just pull in that exposure a touch if you wanted to do that an exposure adjustment is going to be more natural than doing the high dynamic range the high dynamic range is only going to affect a certain part of the the histogram and fall off the exposure will affect the whole image equally so if we're just trying to to dim down the image a little bit having recovered the shadows you can do it with exposure on its own levels again you just like with um, the previous shot using levels to try and enrich that contrast is a good call um, you've already used a bit of the contrast slider on here that works if anything on here i'd be tempted to use brightness in the other way i'd actually lift it a little bit so rather than minus two and brightness helps us it sounds a bit odd so I've, I've pulled back exposure and the reason being because i've moved the entire histogram back to the left but then i've used brightness to squash some of the shadows a bit brighter without pushing those highlights off the edge so we can see a little peak here i don't want to hurt that if i push the exposure too far to the right i'm going to push that peak off if i push brightness to the right it protects that peak but it squashes everything else to be a bit brighter so 
there we get to a, a pretty good place these clouds here I just want to check something so hold down the option key and press any tools reset button and you you don't do it permanently you can temporarily see what's going on um, so up here with these clouds it's not the highlight that's there and actually if I look at the original the cloud is maybe a little bit dull not sure we'll come back to that in a second because we've got on here our shadows in here which again bit of contrast lift bit of shadow lift um, you know a couple of minor adjustments a bit of clarity bit of structure looks pretty good that was the other thing as well by the way in the in this version here look at all this noise and, and harshness that's come out as a result of that shifting in here the noise is still there but we haven't got the harsh contrast lines in there so what we can do is go into our noise reduction tool and just put a little bit in there and it's going to smooth it right up because I haven't got those really really difficult harsh clarity um, elements in here some of this noise is coming from structure I have to say so if we go back here um, to our structure it's probably a little bit over the top we can pull it back to about there that's going to help us and then we'll go on to our highlights so the sky area up here um, now that's been lifted 0.45 let's just try something here uh, not with the new layer I'm going to go to a style brush called funnily enough deep sky and I, I don't know I haven't tried this yet on this job so I don't know what's going to happen but let's just have a look so by doing the deep sky a lot of people think the deep sky darkens everything it darkens the stuff that's not bright if that makes sense so hopefully it does um, but effectively it's darkening the areas of the sky which aren't clouds and it's brightening the areas that are white and are actually clouds. Now look at that. I've gone over the castle and over the tree. Not very good. Very untidy. Well, there's no problem with putting a Luma range in and saying exclude. Let's just turn on our mask. All of those buildings and stuff. Just be careful with the sky up here. So we can apply that. And now I've got maybe a bit more contrast in there it's a bit too much for my liking so maybe we back it off maybe pull it all the way down to sort of 40 percent but is that adding to the image maybe it is um that's that's sort of your call um but on that overall layer at the top what i can now do is pull our levels a bit brighter still and get that cloud to lift up as well so remember this is a layer that was hand painted on has excluded the darkest parts of the image so we're not touching any of, the sh any of the shadows that's done with the luma range and then we're lifting not only using the deep sky brush but we're lifting some of those um, brighter areas to be brighter still by using the levels if we don't like it well we can just turn it off um, but i think that, that to me that adds a bit of boldness to it that sort of works but again entirely your choice oops i missed a bit in this corner down here so, um, Anthony just said, can we put on, sorry, can we put on the exposure warning? There you go. There is our exposure warning. So there is a bit in the clouds here. Deep sky won't have helped that, of course, and nor will have pulling up that levels. So in fact, let's just do it that way and then maybe shift our mid-tones. That might help us a little bit. So what I want to see is that we haven't made it worse for sure. We've not really significantly done that. Um, but you do have a bit of overexposure here with or without the deep sky on there if we turn off this uh what have we got this layer here yeah maybe this layer here isn't helping either um that may be just a push too far on the exposure so then if i start adding deep sky we get into a maybe a better place there um so maybe maybe that works out but oh man if i had to choose between this photo and this one you know what side i'm falling on um, so Michael I, I hope I'm hoping please um, that this was the one that you did a long time ago and you've decided that this is better if this is the one you did a long time ago and you've decided that this one's better having watched some of these um, videos um, don't listen to me ever again reverse yourself go back to <laughs> back to what you were doing before but I think I, I think this is the, uh, the the finish shot let's hope so um, this one definitely not so this one is with um some extra clarity loaded in just for fun um i'm not not quite sure what's gone on here um 
but it's, there's certainly a lot of things going on with saturation and so on. So stick to here. This one's good. Um, stick with that shot. Um, be careful with those HDR sliders. So that's it for today. Uh, next time, next week, we will start off with Michael's shot here um, in terms of output, but that's Michael L's shot. Um, final one there. Uh, Joe's shot of the tree, which, funnily enough, the black and white conversion didn't um, didn't hinder us. It's just maybe out of the box. This one looked a bit more impressive, but when you actually start to look at the edges, um, this is going to be a better overall finish. Fabrizio's um, cool shot of that damselfly, but just be careful with those highlights and be really careful with your luma ranges. If you're creating luma ranges, let me just turn it on, that don't include the, the bits that you're trying to target, then any adjustment you make in terms of high dynamic range is going to have no effect whatsoever. So you're going to need to be careful with that. Um, and then Leo's shot here, reverse GND filters, just be really careful because they can cause this um, and this on the horizon. It can be fixed, as you can see here, but it's never going to be quite um, quite perfect. And back to where we started, this is how we organize our files and clone variants and all that sort of stuff. So that's it uh, for today. Um, that's been quite a decent session, I think. We've covered quite a lot of stuff. Um, in the meantime, if you want to cover other stuff, including um, the secret hideout of where we're going to be hanging out in October, um, so please have a look into that Facebook group. Um, you'll see, hopefully, we'll discuss some of this stuff as well. Um, but if you've got problems and stuff, we can try and fix them in between these sessions. Um, between now and next time, please make sure you upload your images, um, paulreeforlive.wetransfer.com. Please include your name. We always say it every week. It sounds like I'm droning on, but actually it's very important. If you don't include your name, we cannot include your image. It's that simple. You now know how to export an EIP file and all of your variants, so please do that. Um, include the adjustments and we can see what you've done. And between now and next week, so next Thursday, same time, um, do keep in touch through loads of different ways, um, all of them on that screen. But between now and then, take care, look after yourselves, and we'll see you next week. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.